Welcome to the YouTube studio at the Munich Security Conference. I am Adana Steinacker, and I am joined by a phenomenal woman, Dr. Ala Moravit. Ala is a high-level commissioner on health, employment, and economic growth at the United Nations, and also the director of health at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, overseeing global policy, advocacy, and communications. Ala, it's so great to have you here today. Thank you. I will go anywhere you tell me to. You already know that as, as, a, as yeah. a core rule of mine. And it's a pleasure seeing you, considering like a few weeks ago we were on a panel in Davos and now we're here in Munich. I know. And I started just saying yes to when I know you're going to be there. Amazing. That's really because it's always you and I always have these really rich conversations. Yes. And I think we're willing to talk about things and yes. how you actually get them done exactly. in a way that, that it feels like it can be missing from, from some spaces. Amazing. So. I love that. So you have played and continue to play a very significant role in advocating for women's empowerment and gender equality. And in fact, your work challenging women's, the suppression of women's rights in, re, in relation to religious text interpretation was cited by the Human Rights Watch as a pivotal moment in women's rights globally. Yeah. And that's really, really impressive. You. Your work I've followed very closely since getting to know about you and I am so inspired as a woman. So on a policy level, what are some of the strategies you believe are best for advocating for women's rights? You know, it's, um, so I was actually thinking about this before I came today because you and I share so many similarities. We both come from physician backgrounds. We're both scientists by nature. I think we both, um, represent and feel accountable for different communities that aren't often in the room. Mm. And, and I think it's why whenever we have these conversations, it feels, it, it feels both, incredibly challenging because we'll say like, but have you thought about this or have you, but it also feels like we're really talking about solutions at their core. And I think there's three that come to mind as North stars. Mm. The first is I do think ultimately rights are about power. Mm -hmm. um, and I think women's economic power is something we need to actively invest in. Yeah. You and I have spoken in the past about how being able to be accountable and capable of taking care of ourselves and our families has been a mm -hmm. huge part of our identity. Yeah. Um, and that contribution is critically important to the way that we hold and shape power in the world. And I think that's true for women everywhere. Um, and that does mean that there's an accountability to put policies in place yeah. to ensure that education, vocational training, resourcing for that is there. And so really policies and, and, and the political will around women's economic power is critical, which then takes me to something I think is even more important, given that we're at the Munich Security Conference and is women's leadership, particularly in fragile and conflict settings. Yeah. The work that you cited I did when I was in Libya. Um, which ended up evolving and, and impacting countries around the world, but it really started from a place of where do you hold influence or where is your influence challenged in, con in conflict or in fragility? And for a lot of women and for a lot of people, conflict and, and violence means that you tend to move inwards to the communities that you trust. Mm. And that does give more strength to traditional and faith leaders. Yes. And so engaging with those kind of unusual suspects is critically important. But so is recognizing the agency and power and necessity of women's leadership. Um, most people think that, you know, just kind of combining the, the first two, most people think it's actually GDP that means that a country will devolve into conflict either internally or with neighbors, um, when in fact it's the, it's the quick degradation of women's rights. And that alone should tell you quite a bit about what triggers conflict in those kind of um, those shifts. Which brings me to the third. We're both physicians. I think we can both kind of come to the table and say, in order to ensure a girl is educated or a woman has economic power, we have to ensure that they survive. They survive some of those really critical moments in life. Mm. Having a baby should not be the most dangerous day of your life. Exactly. In 2024, for a woman to die in childbirth is absolutely ridiculous. And you add in the fact that we have the tools. Mm. We have them. Yeah. A drape, a postpartum hemorrhage drape for when you are bleeding in birth yeah. that can save a woman's life costs 70 cents. 
70 cents, yeah. right? So, and it's not a high tech innovation. Yeah. It's literally a plastic drape that collects blood to tell you when you need to intervene, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's, I think it's that right to life becomes kind of the hallmark through which yeah. I've looked at it. Yeah. And then of course, we, you know, we talk quite a bit rightly about the importance of investing in girls from a yeah. young age so that we're investing in women as leaders. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in order to do that, you're talking about those first thousand days of a child's life. You're talking about ensuring they have access to immunization. You're talking about ensuring that they have nutrition, that they have proper care. Um, and unfortunately, in, in so much of the world, that's just not not as true as it can and should be. So that's really been the guiding strategies and principles when I look at gender equity, when I look at inclusive security, yeah. when I look at when I look at global leadership. Exactly. So yeah, you, you, you've done a lot of work in inclusive security as well. So how do... How do you see, how do conflicts and crises exacerbate these gender inequalities? Like how, and, and, and what, what are the measures that can be done to protect women and girls in these settings? Well, th- and that's such an excellent question because they both exacerbate gender inequalities yeah. to a significant degree. All conflict, I mean, even the pandemic, because yeah. of the fact that you had uh, you know, a, a crisis situation meant that there was a lot more violence and yeah. things like gender-based violence. Yeah. You know, that really was a silent pandemic, I would argue, that... But they also provide a window of social opportunity mm. because if you if you are able to shift social norms in that time, you can actually put place them in policy and legislation in a way that you otherwise might not be able to. So would you would you think that it's it's easier or more difficult to then shift social norms in situations of conflicts? I think I think it should be easier. It should be easier. I think yeah, we could okay. make it easier. Yeah. I think the I think the inability to do it effectively is less about our social norms and the conflict itself and more about the policies and who we think has value and voice in conflict. And I can give you some examples. I mean, if you look at peace processes, 90% fail within five years, 90%. And you have to imagine these take years to even be put into place. Mm. When you include women at the agenda setting phase, when they sit around the table to say, these are the things that are important to the community, it's 35% more likely to last 15 years. Yeah, wow. So it's not that it can't or we shouldn't do it, but it's more that when we naturally bring people together for peace processes, we bring together the militias, the military leaders, the political leaders, Mm. which means we have a tendency to have a lot more, a lot less inclusive representation of the community at the yeah. table. A lot more men at the table. A yeah. lot more people who are uh, who are incentivized by ongoing conflict, yeah. potentially. And so I think it's, it's actually our accountability as well. When we show up to have these conversations, are we saying we actually demand the representation yeah. of the community? Yeah. Inclusive representation. Yeah, because they can say what they want. Exactly. Yeah. And they can say what you actually Very need great. to sustain yeah. peace. Because yeah. it's one thing to end a conflict. It's a completely different ballgame to build peace. Mm. And we're not very good at, frankly, both, yeah. but we're much worse at the building peace. Yeah. Okay. So at the Munich Security Conference, you spoke at a roundtable on the trajectory of the new pandemic treaty. And I know that I remember the topic is, will it fly? So the question is, will it fly? What are your main messages and goals you know, what, what, do you, what do you really hope will come out of the pandemic treaty? Because, the, I mean, I suppose you're, they're in conversation and the goal is to have a formal draft before the World uh, Health yeah. Assembly yeah. Later, this, later this year. So yeah. where are we and, and what are you seeing? Well, so the, the incredible thing about, about all of this is that this is really member state led and owned. So the foundation isn't, um, isn't involved. No, you know, it really is a member state um, a process. Um, and as all things with countries and member yeah. states, it means there's some pretty active negotiations. Yeah. Um, I think what we, what I find most promising is the recognition that we need to be working together and talking to each other. Yeah. Um, and, and I think if I can take any lesson we've learned from COVID, it's that you can't, you're not going to negotiate with the disease. You're not sitting down at a table, you know, you're not as much as we want to pretend you can, you know, screen for it at airports. You can't do it it, without global cooperation. It is uh, absolutely unrealistic. And so we have things like the global health emergency core, which can really come in, in case of, um, in case of a pandemic. And of course, things like this member state led treaty, which is really meant to negotiate. Okay. What are the ways in which we're going to be working together? Yeah. And this is where I'll say, not just for the treaty, but more broadly, when we talk about global cooperation, I mean, you know this about me. I have 10 brothers and sisters. Yeah. 
And you're and the I, middle child. I'm, I'm the a, middle child. Yeah. <laughs> that's because listen, but but you sh- but that's it's so obvious because you have no real power. <laughs> you have no money. <laughs> You, you're not in charge in any way, so you have to negotiate. But then it, it, it builds your diplomacy, exactly. right? You're Every, negotiating. Everything you learn, Tactics, you learn from being yeah. a middle child yeah. of 11 kids. But... But, you know, we have this thing about global cooperation, like we all have to agree on every single piece and we have to agree on how to get there and we have, which I just don't think is, is true, frankly. I mean, mm. something has to give, there has to be compromised. There, well, and it's not just there has to, I think we have a shared mission yeah. and I say, okay, this is my piece of the puzzle. This is your piece of the puzzle and we work together, mm. but we don't have to be together. And, and I okay. think that's the differentiation that we're slowly learning, not just for the, the pandemic treaty, but across all of our work, what part of the puzzle is your piece? Yeah. What part is mine? And so at the foundation, we always say, because we're a philanthropy, we're able to take risks. Mm. We're able to try things other people won't. Yeah. We firmly believe in the power of innovation and, and making sure people have the tools in their local communities, their local health centers. Mm. That drape I spoke about, for example, mm. that 70 cent drape that can save so many people's lives. And then we do that in partnership with private sector. Mm-hmm. And then we look to government, obviously, to scale and to yeah. ensure that we're implementing the right policies and we're really advancing this at, at that kind of country and, and access and service point. And without every single person in that puzzle, you're not going to accomplish it. Okay, and so it, it just reiterates then the the need for international organizations, NGOs, not just state-led. It really exactly. just doesn't have to be that concrete. Exactly. Private sector. Yeah. There, there needs to be a recognition that this really is all hands on deck for the next pandemic. And, it, you know, this treaty is a component of that, but there is so much more in terms of global cooperation that we really need to be talking about and thinking about. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, if, if COVID was any indication, the economic, social, cultural mm-hmm. um, fallout has been so significant for so many people around the world and, and we have it in our hands to prevent that from happening again yeah and then just going back to you going back to the analogy you made that the all of the parts of the puzzle doesn't have to fit but at least we agree on what it mission, should look like what it should look like i know but we you i mean you do agree that equity should be should be that a puzzle that fits well equity should be the cornerstone yeah, i mean it's exactly. unrealistic to be talking about any type of health or social or development or even security um, challenge and solution without a- anchoring equity because yeah. a lack of equity only perpetuates all of yeah, those but things. But that wasn't the case for the, I mean, of course, it's the very, it's the first one we experienced, the first pandemic, yeah. but really the, in the global South, we, oh, we couldn't really relate to, to equitable access to vaccination. Absolutely. Right? No, yeah. I completely agree. And I think that's why it's so necessary for us to be having these mm. conversations now, because imagine the next one. And if we yeah. don't actually talk about this yeah. and if we don't actually create the guardrail to ensure, because equity isn't something that naturally happens in mm. conflict, crisis, or pandemic. Mm. Um, you know, I, I think I firmly believe in people's good intentions, but I also have actively lived in conflict. Mm. I mean, you tend to do what you can do when you can do it, yeah. and very much look at the space in which you occupy to enable that. And that yeah. doesn't necessarily translate to is yeah. everybody at the table? Yeah. Is everybody getting equal access? Yeah. Am I being representative of everybody in the community? Mm. Those things don't always translate unless we intentionally build them in. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I wanna, I, I could exp- I could keep exploring this topic, but we'll do it off camera. And okay, what are the importance of also gender specific health policies in, in this treaty? Where does it sit? Because we know, for example, in the case of another pandemic, yeah. there is going to be increased gender based violence. Yeah. There's going to be women, you know, displaced. Education will be halted for girls. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, where, where does policy come in to make sure that women are not disadvantaged? In That is such an excellent question. I'm a pretty firm believer that that policy should exist at all times. Yeah. Because we, we live right now, for many women around the world, they are in a silent pandemic mm. of inequity, yeah. of violence, of... of marginalization, mm. of inaccess to basic services. I mean... There's some pretty, you know, when I, we both have children, when you were pregnant, did you get tested for anemia? Like your iron, your, your iron level? I did. Did you? I did. Yeah, I did. And I was anemic. Yeah. And I could go. I mean, I was anemic too, yeah. Did, did you actually take the, the, uh, <laughs> the iron pills? Oh, yeah. we'll, we can talk about that. No. <laughs> but you could go to like the local pharmacy and you could get iron pills yeah. and, and it was, it was easy. And when I needed to, I could get an IV iron mm-hmm. infusion seamlessly. 
And anemia seems like such a small thing to most of us who have access to that easily. Mm -hmm. In many parts of the world, it actually means that you're having lower birth weight children. You're having mm. higher risk during delivery. You're having a higher risk of, of child loss. Mm. That's pretty significant. And it's anemia. It's stuff that we yeah. think and we know we have solutions for. And yeah. so the question of how we bring those solutions to more people, not how we ask, how can more people come to us? Mm, yeah. But instead we say, how do we get there? But, how do yeah. we actually provide service? How do we shift policy? How do we shift resourcing to actually Access, meet the yeah. most marginalized, yeah. to meet the most, the poorest of the poor? Mm. And in order to do that effectively, it can't be me and you and, you know, everybody sitting around in a, at a table in, in Munich or London or New York. We actually need to be talking to people from the community. Yeah. They need to co-architect the yeah. policies. They need to say, this is what we need. Yeah. And that's what I think is so critical about mm. gender policies or gender gender transformational or policies that really meet women where they are when it comes to health is what do you need? Not yeah. what do we think you should have, yeah. but what do you actually need? Yeah. Yeah. Like involving grassroots um, organizations, community led projects. And also I suppose on a more local level, this is where faith-based leaders and members of the community that that are trusted, exactly. right? Rather than international organizations swooping in to say, parachuting this is what in and out. Need. Exactly. Yeah, because then there will be no, you can provide all of the medicines and the tech, but then when there is no trust and people don't, take up the exactly. services, then it's, it's a waste. hundred percent. It? And, yeah. and it's why at the foundation, I, you know, we believe so strongly in actually providing the resources to local organizations mm. and to organizations that operate in country to be able to say, you know, we, we might not know, mm. but you do, you yeah. know, your situation, you know, the reality better than anybody else. Let's work mm. together. Let's bring those innovations. Let's talk about what's needed at the community and local level, and let's do it in partnership rather than be prescriptive or, or parachute in and out to your yeah. point. Amazing. And that, that was the, that is a wrap up of the conversation because my last question was what role do international organizations play in supporting health policies and and um take up of all these services and you've just you just yeah mentioned i think that, yeah. i think it's resourcing i think yeah. it's policy and i think it's influence yeah um, and i think that's the role international organizations really should and and, and need to play mm. and there's an accountability piece we don't often talk about but we really should this accountability and this humility that we need to that we need to anchor more in our leadership mm -hmm. as institutions to say, listen, we're here, we're partners, mm -hmm. we don't know everything, we need to co-build together and we need to co-architect. And we're also accountable to one another yeah. to continue to show up for one another exactly. and to advance these policies in a sustainable way. Amazing. I look forward to I look forward to the the final treaty, the final pandemic treaty. And uh, when will you be at the next World Health Summit then? Uh, you and I always end up yeah, finding we'll each end other. Up, yeah, exactly. So we'll, so. Find our way there. Yeah. we'll find our yeah, way there. But I, I'm looking forward to an equitable and um, gender inclusive treaty. Yeah. And a, and a, and a one human approach, right? Exactly. One, one health, one human. Well, and there's, one, yeah. And, you know, it's not just the pandemic. I mean, there's so many things that are really like this year alone, you know, when we were in Davos and we announced the Women's Health Global Alliance, mm. um, which was big really, deal. which was an incredibly big deal, yeah. but really aimed to look at the um, the necessity of, to your point, policies mm. and resourcing that go to women's health yeah. and women's health research and development, which takes like a less than one percent portion, which is, um, mm. and then you look at something like Gavi, which is the mm. the you know vaccine alliance, yeah. which provides immunizations and has over the course of the past twenty years to a billion children. Yeah. So there's so many opportunities for us in global health to say we believe in equity, we're going yeah. to resource it, and we're going to build policies that support it. Um, so so the, it's the treaty is is one step there, but there are so many others right. about really really kind of addressing those challenges as yeah. they exist today. I think the treaty is the middle child and there's still about like four siblings. It's negotiating <laughs> today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Ala, it's been fantastic having you here at the studio. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the conference and I will see you in the next country. Yes. Then. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. All right, thank you.